So uh, this is quite <laughs> a, an unusual interview, an unusual episode today, because uh, until probably like 35 or 40 minutes ago, me and Kenji have never met. I heard of mm -hmm. Kenji uh, since about a week ago, you know, a common friend of mine and uh, my associate, he, he was talking about you, bro. And he was uh, telling stories about that you're into the wellness, you know, that, that you're trying to transform your body, you, you're into the nutrition and, and so on and so on. And I'm very interested in people who are very enthusiastic and passionate about doing something and especially when it comes to the personal transformation in whatever form it is where whether uh spiritual uh, psychological <laughs> physical transformation uh, or recovery from illnesses or when people go through certain hardships you know and hurdles and stuff like that when they really put an effort and not just blindly put an effort when people know and understand what exactly they're doing so it's a conscious mm -hmm. effort. It's a product of some study. It's a product of some research, a personal research. And uh, when, when you do it for the right reason, you know, and, and you have an expected goals, you know, that you want to achieve, at least that's what I'm doing for myself. You know, I, I never start any practice, whether it uh, uh, involves my nutrition or it involves my lifestyle or exercise or any specific chemical compounds or whatsoever before I research that. And I research yeah, that and, and I have the goal, you know, what exactly I want to achieve, okay, where I'm going to, you know, so I, I it, it shouldn't be pointless, okay? Yeah. So, bro, I know that very little of you, I just had a very short conversation that we started, but I'm really thrilled and excited to hear more. So, um, the way, the pathway that you have chosen is uh, something towards the nutrition, right? And the yep. actual reason what pushed you to do that was your personal desire, right? So was there a need yep. uh, to do that? Was there some uh, a medical need to do that? Or are you just passionate and enthusiastic about uh, maintaining your health or achieving something? So how exactly it started? So hi, everyone. My name is Kenji. All right. I started on my nutrition journey about four, four to five years ago now. It's 2020, mm -hmm. so that makes it five years. All right, so back in 2015, I was fat. I was humongous. <laughs> I was a 174 cm tall, but right. I was 115 kgs. And that was the last I measured. Uh, if you look at my picture, I think I was like about 30. 35 or something like that, right? The BMI yeah, was probably yeah. 35. Yeah, because my, my, my BMI was crazy. That I was, I was 120 kilo. Wow, <laughs> I, I, you know, it used to be 190 or 188 now. You know, it's good, sort of shrinking and getting shorter with age, you know. But I mean, I always yeah. been a big guy, you know, not a, there was like an excessive amount of fat, you know, that I gradually mm. gained, you know, the gym, you know, and stuff like that. I was heavyweight yeah. in martial yeah. arts, you know, and stuff like that. So I was, always was an heavyweight. So I can imagine. So you were 117, yeah, right? 115. 115. With uh, 178 yeah. cm, well, yeah, that's pretty heavy, man. I, yeah, I know how it feels. Really yeah. heavy. I know how it feels. <laughs> Getting up in the morning was the biggest exercise of my life. <laughs> right, right, and then gradually so, have the, all the back pain, the ankle pain. You know, when when you run, the knee pain, knee pain. Yeah. How old yeah, were you that time? I used to. Uh, I was 27. At that time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a housemate. Uh, he was half my size, half. He was 150 cm, but he was half my weight, like 80, 80 kg. Mm -hmm. And it used to be when I when I was going up the stairs, he would be like, "Kenji, come on, man, can you walk faster?" <laughs> <laughs> because we we live on the second floor. Yeah. So walking up that staircase to get to the second floor was was hell on my knees. It was, it was so bad on my knees. Um, and one day, uh, a friend of mine came over and he told me, he said, uh, Kenji, why don't you look into a different form of business? At that time, at that time I was running a cafe mm -hmm. and it was a very stressful business. Mm -hmm. So my friend came over and told me, why don't you look into another form of business? And he sat down and discussed business plans with me. 
while we were discussing the business plans, okay, he suddenly looked at me and said, KG, are you all right? And I was like, I'm okay. I'm not doing anything wrong, am I? And he said, no, you're, you're bleeding. And I was like, I'm bleeding? Where? <laughs> so apparently, my nose was bleeding. All right. And I didn't know that my nose was bleeding. It was, it was bleeding like, like, a, like, a, like a waterfall. Yeah? Mm -hmm. the, the blood was dripping off my nose and, and, and falling onto the piece of paper when I noticed it. And that was when my friend said, Kenji, you really need to do something about your health. Um, he was an old friend of mine. When I was 16 years old, I was hospitalized for four months. Mm -hmm. He was the friend that, that came to visit me when I was 16. All right. And then now he's seeing me fall sick again. And he's like, Kenji, I don't want you to go through that again, bro. We've been friends for so long. Don't, don't die on me, bro. So, so that was how uh, we started. I, I started on my journey to better health. I see. Well, well what, what, how was it before that? I mean, were you like having a tremendously unhealthy lifestyle by the standards of your peers or your family or something like that or it was just normal and generally same as everyone else out there you didn't do anything like especially harmful like i mean too much of soda coca-cola you know or some totally junk food only you know what do you like there or there was no specific reason you know for you becoming uh, that morbid thinking back uh you know thinking back I was always fat. I've always been fat. Like mm -hmm. ever since I was eight years old, I was always been big. Right. Uh, when, when I was really young, like two to four years old, I was really skinny. Mm -hmm. But after that, I had a growth spurt and then I was big all the way. Uh, being big all the way, you don't really feel different, you know? You, you, right. Everything feels the same for you. Right. Uh, but I don't drink. Mm -hmm. I don't drink excessively. Uh, I think what Joel drinks in a week is probably my entire year's drinking. <laughs> All right, you know that yeah. you drink anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I used to smoke when I was uh, in school, uh, but I quit when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And I've never touched a cigarette since I was 16. Never, not even for acting, none. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't do drugs. I mean, no more. I, I've never done it anymore. I tried it when I was in school. You know, you were school. The school's crazy, you know. The, there are a lot of funny, funny things that you try when you're in school that you never do again when you're older. Life is life. <laughs> so coming up to when I was 25 and above, the only, the only uh, issue I had with my lifestyle was the sleeping habits. I can't mm -hmm. sleep. I generally find it very difficult to sleep. Mm. Uh, I would I would stay awake for five days, six days sometimes, with only maybe one or two hours sleep every day, uh, just to do stuff. I like I like working, so I end up building projects. I end up running businesses. I started I started so seven businesses. So when you don't sleep in the night, in the night, well, time, so you the usually night. do something, right? You have some kind of activity, yeah. some creative stuff, or something like that. Are you a late eater? or a night, at least were you a night eater? And there were so many people, they eat like midnight, they eat 2, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., even later, you know, as long as they stay awake, they work, you know, they keep on throwing something in, you know, the fuel, <laughs> you know, the carbs, yeah. you know, and the cookies, you know, and all that stuff, the chocolates, you know, whatever, nonstop. Usually that's yeah. how people sustain themselves, you know, and that cheap fuel for the brain, you know, you keep on throwing yeah. glucose, you know, just excessively, you process it. Well, you probably you can stay. Well, that's a, the most, or at least the second most uh, addictive substance, you know, and I'm talking about sugar, glucose and fructose. Yeah. Uh, it's only comparable I... with nicotine, probably. Yeah, even, even uh, cocaine is not that addictive. It's about eight, something like that, times less. Uh, addictive yeah. than uh, sugar. But the funny thing yeah. there, I, I need to look for that, you know, for the evidence, you know, I was reading before that, both in animal and human studies, uh, both animals and humans, they gave up on cocaine for the sake of sugar. Yeah. Uh, that, that addictive, the substance. Yeah, that was an amazing piece of research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, uh, the cause of death 
the sugar is 20, 28 times more lethal compared to cocaine, which yeah. like, plus mortality yeah, exactly. times high. Right? It's really crazy. <laughs> Do you know the story of that, by the way? You know the story of that? Which, I, that I, the story how, where they did the research? The, no, no, the story how the fructose was introduced on a large scale. I might not be 100% right, okay, but allegedly that, well, well, it's, it's a fact that, uh, you know, there's the sugar corn syrup stuff that contains yeah. a lot of fructose, you know, it was invented by one Japanese, either chemist or I, I forgot his name. Okay, so he invented that in 1960s, like 66 or 68, something like that. And in yeah. the early 70s, I, I, I guess in 1974, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, uh, just a few months before the presidential elections, when the Nixon was uh, going for the re-election, he called up the boss <laughs> of the Food and Drug Administration and he told him that, okay, you have a task. You have to solve the problem of uh, a food nutrition or lack of uh, accessible food for the population. Make sure that this question never ever comes back on the presidential debate before the presidential election in the United States. And they're like, all right, what can we do? We need some cheap, really cheap stuff that can just shove in the calories, you know, keep happy, you know, with absolutely zero nutritional value. And they took that corn syrup and they start adding it everywhere. Uh, it's in uh, <laughs> ketchup sauce, you know, anything. And then it's like, you add a lot of sugar there, you know, or, or any other chemical stuff, and that sweetness, it just kills that taste. And you keep on consuming that, and it's just like crazy. Yeah, we we yeah. supposed to get not more like five gram or even less than that or something per day. Well, anyway, we have the gluconeogenesis. Yeah, so we can produce yeah. it essentially. Yeah. You know what, the, your story, what you're telling is very much similar to me. Although I, I went to gym in the age of 13 years old, first time in my life and I started doing bodybuilding when I was 30. I was playing tennis, wow. you know, and then uh, I was doing martial arts late in the university. I was doing uh, Aikido and I was doing the karate. You know, I have the black belt and a third done in karate. I was even fighting oh. veterans, you know, and, and a heavyweight uh, until like about well, seven years ago. I Last year when I was competing, it was 2013. I got some bronze. I got, wow. I, I got one gold medal in heavyweight kumite, a bunch of third places, bronzes and stuff like that. But I always had that problem with excessive weight. You know, I was a big guy, probably strong, but for my size, I should have been even stronger, you know? And then uh, I've done huge efforts to lose weight. It did work for a short while, many, many times, but I never could achieve a stable desired relatively low weight with a proper body composition until just a few years ago, you know, when I sort of, I found that formula finally, you know, after 28 years of literally biohacking <laughs> myself, I have found that formula about, then I found that it was about three, four years ago. I was very, very close, oh. you know, but I was very close in the uh, mid, uh, in the early 2010s, like about eight years ago, seven years ago, you know, and then uh, with too much stress at work and same story that you are telling now when yeah. you arrive in the shop. And I was there in a spin of my career and work in the hospital. Like for three years, I was on call every day. Okay. Oh. There was an episode in my life, you know, I was like, That's every crazy, night right? I go in back to hospital and my, I had no proper sleep. <laughs> I was expecting phone calls from the ward, you know, and that was like, no, that was my normal life for three years. And I adapted wow. to that. I adapted to that. I adapted to that uh, by developing uh, diabetes and metabolic syndrome and obesity, being 120 kilograms, you know, with hypertension you know, and stuff like that. And oh, then a constant stress, man. We smoke, you know, doctors were smoking all the time, you know. Me and my yeah. mate in the <laughs> hospital, you know, we're smoking on the, <laughs> on the staircase, you know, in the, yeah, yeah. In between the, 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 the levels, you know. It, that, that was crazy and, and I was physically active at the same time you know doing gym and, and mm -hmm. my martial arts and stuff like that but it's still not helping you know so the yeah. stress stress and absolutely horrific nutrition okay then mm -hmm. what almost nearly ruined me you know and, mm -hmm. and that was like I was in the late 30s okay considered very young you know and then, then I 
Well, I'm not going to tell you what I've, uh, at least not now, what I was doing for myself because I'm here to hear your story. So I can imagine you're in your late 20s and you're quite obese and you come to the state where you have a spontaneous nasal bleed. So were you hypertensive? Did anyone diagnose you with hypertension, fatty liver disease? Did anyone tell you you will have like diabetes or, or something, some endocrine disorder, you know? I mean, did you even see the doctor? No, man. I, I wouldn't dare to see the doctor. My grandmother had diabetes. My grandfather died of liver failure. Uh, my, my uncle died of liver failure. So there, there's, a, there's a thick, there's a thick history, you know, it's like, it's like the Bible, this thick history, family <laughs> of history. medical records. Yeah. yeah. Every time someone in the family goes to see the doctor, they come back with a diagnosis that is so negative. <laughs> they just die from negativity. Right, right. right. So, so you, you check them and everything looks all right. You know, your medical yeah. checkup, you, you, you fast through that, your, your yearly medical checkup, you know? Um, you know, bro, like when, from the nutrition point of view, you know, when you look not even on the micronutrients, okay, we're, we're yet to come to this topic here, okay? Yeah. But just to, 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 to generally give the impression of how conventional medical system has failed in all countries, all over the world, in terms of nutrition, okay? Because mm -hmm. not a single university, probably, you know, maybe like one or two in the world, does not include a proper nutrition classes or some module into any MBBS or MD program anywhere in the world. You can exactly. say that nearly none of the doctors graduating in the medical school has actually been taught about nutrition. And the stuff that we yeah. eat, we can be so under nutrition uh, on, on the very essential things like the magnesium, you know, or sodium, and stuff yeah. like that. And the blood investigation that we're doing is reflecting only one or two percent of your actual electrolyte <laughs> in your body, you know, and that will be the exactly. very last thing that will deteriorate. And then happens when patient goes to the ICU, you know, the, the hypometriemia, yeah. you know, the low sodium, it, the, the people have convulsions, you know, and seizures and, and, and they have uh, an immediate cognitive decline, you know, and absolutely they can't help in ICU. Exactly. I mean, you don't look for that. It will take you ages, you know, to get there in a yeah. very quick <laughs> way. And your body is such an incredible, intelligent system that it can adapt to whatever yes. horrific conditions you put yourself with that crap nutrition that you eat, with the absolute yes. absence of exercise, where the stuff that you inhale, like smoking, you know, I, I'm guilty as charged, you know, I'm an ex-smoker. <laughs> okay, I started smoking in the age of 13 years old, okay, which probably my parents don't even know about that. And I was smoking like 23 <laughs> years, okay, 23 wow. <laughs> years of a smoking career. And when I stopped that horrible habit, and the second thing that I quit in my life was sugar, you know, so th there was these two addictions. You know, which I, I look at as addictions, you know, this the nicotine smoking and food. Just and sugar food addiction. And carbohydrates. Yeah. Oh. So when you get rid of that, you feel finally I can live life. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, after that bleeding, and you're still not going to doctor. You're still no. not 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 seeking for any point of reference and all. Or or you did, or you did your own research. What what, what have you done? After, after that incident, uh, all my friends told me to go seek for medical advice. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually did uh, meet up with a doctor. Uh, he took my blood test. He took my, the, the usual, you know, the blood works. They take your blood pressure. They tell you to do. And he couldn't find anything wrong with me at all. He right. couldn't. I, before, before I started running my restaurant and my cafe later, I used to be very active. I would cycle everywhere. Uh, I was a basketball player. I was a badminton player. So I would do a lot of sports. But once I started the cafe, I was feeling so tired every day. I just mm -hmm. couldn't move. Mm -hmm. I thought it was because I was too heavy. <laughs> so I, I, I honestly thought that I was too heavy and I couldn't move because I was just so heavy. But later, when I went down to New Zealand for 
for a family trip, okay, mm -hmm. one of the conversations that started during that time was, why don't you take a look into nutritional health for yourself? So a friend recommended me to look into nutritional health for myself. And I started researching. Uh, I'm from the engineering background. I graduated with a electrical, electrical electronics, mechanical, and power engineering degree. And uh, so I love uh, technical papers. I, mm -hmm. I love reading journals and stuff. So when I was in New Zealand, I had a lot of access. Their libraries there are well stocked. So I had access to some of these documents. I read them. And I got really interested. So when I came back to Malaysia, I continued my research and I found out about uh, Dr. Osumi's work in autophagy. And, Dr. Osumi, uh, can, can, you, can you pronounce that, the, the, the full name? So that, you know, I'm going to put the link, I'm going to put the photograph, you know, and some references later. Dr. <laughs> How? Dr. Osumi, right? How do you spell that? Yeah, that's O-H-S-U-M-I. Uh -huh. Yeah, he's the... 2016 Nobel Prize winner mm -hmm. for science. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can search him there. It's easy. Right. Uh, he did the work on autophagy. Autophagy, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was one of the research that I really looked into. Mm -hmm. And another, another one that kick-started my, kick my interest uh, was this book uh, called Optimal Nutrition. Uh, written mm -hmm. by Dr. Johnson. I, I can't remember his full name right now. So these two uh, pieces of research were what really started me looking into nutri nutrition and nutrigenomics uh, as an extension of that, how the nutrition that you take uh, affects your genetic build-up mm -hmm. and genetic makeup later. So those things were what really got me interested. So I did a lot, a lot, a lot of research. And one thing I noticed about my body at that time was a lot of the illness that I felt, the uh, spontaneous nasal bleeding, mm -hmm. uh, the lethargy in the morning, the anemia, uh, the lack of energy, mm -hmm. the obesity, the water retention. These were all symptoms and signs of nutritional lacking in my body that I didn't know at all. Mm -hmm. So after... After I did my research, I started changing my diet. I started uh, eating differently. I still eat at night. I, I still right. eat at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but now that I know uh, these things, okay. the hold things on, I eat hold on, change. A second, bro. hold on a second. Now, I, I want to know mm -hmm. how it really started. Like, have you, you researched that completely? You had some kind of a system or you had some kind of a schedule and you just said, okay, this is day one or day zero of my self-experiment so i'm gonna do this this and that or it was like gradually the more you read uh like every page by page you you find a new stuff and you're like all right i didn't know that probably i can do this change that change it was like that slow and gradual or you just went full on like from day zero into some specific program it's a little bit of both mm -hmm. uh when i first started i was very lucky that i started with dr osumi's research first and from Dr. Dr. Osumi's research, I understand that uh, it's very important. Two things are very important. The, the amount of time you are not eating mm -hmm. and the amount of protein you get on a daily right. basis. Right. So I started with, oh, protein is very important. So I, I, would, I would think of eating proteins first, mm -hmm. okay? getting into high protein and stuff like that. And at the same time, that was the time where everybody was starting to get very uh, fanatical about paleo diets about okay. the high protein low low yeah. high protein low carb diet something yeah. like that so i said okay i agree with the high protein part so i'm going to stick with the high protein part mm -hmm. and then when i read into nutrigenomics uh, under dr johnson's work that was when i was exposed to oh there's uh, seven major nutrition in the body your proteins your carbohydrates your fats your vitamins your minerals your fiber and your water so these seven are very important and you need a certain balance so from there, I built up a system uh, based on what I read. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I decided to start my program, okay, uh, my program was like this. Get a lot of protein every day. Okay? Reduce the amount of carbohydrates you take uh, mm -hmm. to a necessary amount. Don't, 
don't overeat the carbohydrates. Okay, mm-hmm. don't don't reach for that hundred plus or that Coca Cola mm-hmm. <laughs> unless you really have to. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. make sure to monitor your micro uh, your micronutrient balance within right. your vitamin A, your vitamin C. Make sure you get enough vitamin B. Uh, make sure you get enough vitamin D. Right. Now that I understand the power of vitamin D, I can't stress how important vitamin D is, right. especially now that everybody's staying at home. Yeah, yeah it's it's yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. Right. So so uh, with that, then I started a program that for myself, I started a program uh, that I call the 4K fitness plan. 4K. And it was a. Why yeah, 4K? It was basically a. The K stands for knowing yourself. All right. The first thing you need to know is know yourself. Correct. The second thing you need to know is knowing where you want to be, your goals. Absolutely. Okay. Then the third thing is knowing your challenges, what is stopping you from getting your goals. Right. Right. And the last right. one is to motivate yourself. You need to know how far you have progressed along the way. Right. So these were the four Ks in the 4K fitness plan. Yeah. So based on that, I tailor made myself a diet plan and I stuck to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, within within three months, mm-hmm. I went from 115 kg to 72 kg. Right. So it's within three or and a half months. Kilos. Yeah. Forty kilos. Right. Yeah. Right. It's about thirty plus kilos in three and a half months. Mm-hmm. In hundred and ten days. Yeah. So was it just changing the ratio of nutrition? Or you you mentioned that the fasting period as well, right? Did you start following the fasting period? Because you can achieve autophagy. You can't achieve autophagy if you uh, do not fast for at least 18 hours. That's for for the Homo Uh, sapiens. Sorry, 12 hours. 12 hours. Yeah, you need minimum a 12 hour uh, fasting period for you. Yeah, for you to even trigger that process of autophagy. But if you want that to be quite effective. That's why it should be like that, 16 hours or 18 hours. And then the beauty of that is that biologically, you don't have to really do that every day. I'm not saying that it it should be like something that once in a week, you know, but uh, like every alternate day is good enough, you know, but as long as you have that 12 hour fasting period throughout your entire existence, that is very, very, very important. Right? The beautiful thing, the very beautiful thing about it, uh, about autophagy, is that you do it every day. If, if you sleep eight hours a day, okay, mm-hmm. and you don't eat something within the first three hours before you sleep, you're already starting autophagy uh, internally. You, you yes. don't realize it, but you know, it's already there. Yeah, you're That's already sleep is so hour, important. 12 hour period, yes. Yeah. Uh, according to Dr. Osumi's research, 10, 10 hours and above, you start, you start triggering autophagy mm-hmm. uh, reactions in your body, mm-hmm. depending on which part of your body. So that's why sleep is so important. That's why people keep saying that sleep is important. It's not just the sleep. The sleep, yes, it is important. On top of sleeping, you're triggering autophagy in your body naturally, right. and that causes your body to you know, uh, rebuild itself while you're sleeping. That's why, that's why I really agree that... Uh, don't eat too late is a, is a very good concept because if you're going to eat one hour before you sleep, then when you wake up in the morning, you don't really feel that hungry. So you're going to spend a few hours before you start eating your first meal. And that, right. that is also autophagy right there right. happening. But it, it's like still it better from, uh, from many other points of view. It's still better to have that minimum three hours, but ideally even more than that, five or six hours between the last oral intake, between the last meal, and uh, yep. the time when you go to bed. Not even saying that, there was a research done and it was published first about 10, 12 years ago, about 2008. It was a research about the presence of the melatonin receptors in the pancreatic gland, on, on, in the, on the mm-hmm. cells of the pancreas. And it has uh, a negative or the inhibitory effect. The melatonin actually yep. suppresses the function of the pancreatic gland you produce and, and long story short it means that you will gain twice the amount of calories and you will store twice the amount of yeah. glycogen and fat if you eat during the time when you have a high uh, activity of melatonin means during the evening night time and stuff like that 
You know, so you, you are doing actually the double harm to yourself. Not even talking about uh, you're disrupting your neurogenesis, you are impairing your sleep just because you pump the glucose. You know, it's one of the yep. great examples is if even the infants do not force feed them or small kids, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. don't force feed them when they're falling asleep or in the night, you know, because they will have the disturbed sleep. And then apart from that, you know, they'll have that bloated tummy and yep. you know, all the fermentation <laughs> in their gut. I mean, that's totally unphysiological. If you look at the biology of this, we as species, I mean, which other species is fed on demand? Probably only the cows and chicken in the slaughterhouse, you know, but no wild yeah. animal, no biological species ever, you know, uh, 4.5 billion history of this planet, of this <laughs> biosphere has been fed on demand, especially when yeah, you were exactly. low movement, hypo dynamic, you know, sitting in, in front of the TV with a remote control, you know, and just scrolling <laughs> all the pages in your phone. Man, that's biological yeah. insanity <laughs> come on exactly it's like why are you <laughs> how did you even survive to this age you know that, that that's an incredible part of it you know our yeah. grandparents our parents didn't do that if you got to be born say 100 years ago you would have gone through the first world war second world war great depression <laughs> uh, you know some uh, uh everything communi Civil communist war. china with the cultural revolution war in vietnam you know and, and stuff like that and for korea and uh, the life was full of hardships and people never had that ready-made yep. entertainment at the tip of their finger you know and the food you can order grab and stuff like that and that, that's crazy but when i was a yeah. kid you know, in the early 80s, uh, a bottle is 330 milliliter bottle of Pepsi Cola or Coca Cola was a was a goddamn luxury. You know, that, that you get yeah, like yeah. once in a week, you know, maybe once in two weeks, you know, it's <laughs> like a treat from parents. And now, like, you drink that really instead of water. Wow. Yeah. Incredible, <laughs> incredible. So, <clears throat> Let, let me recap again. You introduced uh, more or less like uh, uh, quite fast, you know, the entire program, entire system when you have restricted the time to when you eat, you try to normalize your sleep, but most importantly, you've built a proper pyramid, right? Of your, yep. your nutritional pyramid with, uh, yep. a, as you've said, with just enough amount of carbs, okay? Yep. Just enough amount of carbs, heavy protein, fats, right? What sort of yeah. fats? What sort of fats? Because there's vegetarian, I mean, the vegetable fat, and there's a, a yeah. animal fat. That's, so that's a very, fats, fats is a very interesting topic. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a one hour, I did a one hour lecture on fats uh, a few okay. months ago. <laughs> I compress it now and compress and shoot it. Okay, let's do the fast, fast review of the one hour lecture about fats. So, because I'm a great fan of fats, brother. I gotta tell you, I'm a great fan of yeah. fats. Absolutely. Wow. You know, like the cheese, you know, and all that sour cream stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and when I look at the table <laughs> of content, when I see the zero or less than 0 0.01 amount of uh, gram or whatever percent of carbohydrate, and it's mostly uh, all the saturated, mono and fully unsaturated fats and protein, that's the best product that I go for. Okay. So, yeah. fats. Fats from Mr. Kenji Lee. <laughs> so, fats. Uh, the one hour lecture, if I just summarize it, will be three, three main points, three main takeaways about fats that I think everyone should look into, okay, mm -hmm. uh, is that number one, the thing about fats is they are good for you, all right? Right, right. Fats in moderation is superb, it's, it's really, really good for you. Uh, I had a friend who had uh, creaky knees, she will have, when she goes down the staircase, her knees will go cut, 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 yeah, cut. Yeah, the crepitation. Every, yeah, how every, every friend? morning how, you how, can how hear. How old was that friend? How old was she? She's about 48 at the time. 48, and, and osteoarthritis, yeah. so that you can hear that. Mm. Uh, it, 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 hasn't, it hasn't gone to the level of osteoarthritis. It was about to. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I said, uh, you shouldn't be avoiding your fats. You should take your fats as you go along but try to get better fats. Don't get the low quality fats that, you know, people fry their bread in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. five, six times, and then they still use that fat to go fry your rice. Don't do that. 
get good quality fats. Like for example, get your olive oil for your dressing. Right. That's fine. All right. Get right. your, um, I, I recently found this fruit. It's called GAP. G-A-P. Mm-hmm. G-A-P. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's this orange colored fruit with spikes. Mm-hmm. It looks like a, it looks like a mango with a lot of spikes. It's like mm-hmm. a mango sized durian. All right. Do you know about durians? Oh yeah, absolutely. All right, so of course, I'm a durian fan. But oh, I don't. Wow. I eat then, that then, like once in a year, once in two years. <laughs> Not yeah, too yeah. But you, I, you can't take the craving because you, you know you got that yeah. special durian craving. Like, come on, Southeast Asian yeah. durians. You know, it's a kind of food. But but I otherwise I I've cut down on all that stuff. The only food that I eat. Like I do eat apples once in a while when I really crave. So I maybe, uh, you know, the crave for iron or something. I have like once in two months the craving for banana. So I might like eat like a bunch of bananas. And um, the only fruit that I allow to eat myself is uh, avocado. Right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So avocado. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. And, yeah, yeah. And it has avocado is full of fat. Full of fats, right, right. Yeah. And, and some, of, some people, what they do is they take the avocado. Avocado is full of fats. Mm-hmm. And if you take it raw, it's good. It's good for you. Mm-hmm. Okay? But what a lot of people do is they take it, they fry it. Because oh. they're Asian, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then when they fry it, the fats change. Especially if okay. you overcook them. Right. Then there's a chance that the fats will start changing uh, because of the molecular breakdown and stuff like right. that. So, that's always something you want to be avoiding. So I, I always tell people that take your good fats, take your olive oils, take your mm-hmm. flaxseed oils. Uh, I recently, I was talking about gut. So this, this fruit called gut, okay? Mm-hmm. The skin of the fruit is used in a lot of Vietnamese cooking. Okay. Which and, is quite a healthy diet in entire Southeast. Yeah. Asia. One of the healthiest. Uh, the amount of omega-3 fats in gut fruit, okay, is easily high, as high quality as fish omega-3, mm-hmm. if not higher. Mm-hmm. And the abundance of gut fruit means that you can get it cheaper and easier than getting your salmon. Right. So I, I told right. a lot of my vegetarian friends, right. especially vegetarian people, they can't eat, they can't eat fish. So gut is a very good alternative. I keep telling them, please, if you can, uh, go find the nearest Vietnamese restaurant and get the guy to fry some gut for you. But it can be quite so, challenging for vegans or vegetarians to get a good supply. They, well, you, can, you still can get lots of protein, but when it's coming to fats, that might be a bit challenging. Yes. Uh, it will be predominantly the carbohydrate and if they will put an extra effort of heavy fiber, which is great, you know, but too much of carbs yeah. and most dangerous that they are at risk of being low on fat in their diet. Yes. Well, brother, I, yes. You, you, you mentioned this, that people fry, because you say in Asia, the culture of food might be like that, the avocados and all. I got to ask you this question. Pisang goreng, yeah. you know, the fried fried banana, pisang goreng. Yeah. Okay. And pisang especially yeah. When, when you fry that, we refry, reuse, reutilize that. Oh, uh, delicious. <laughs> but, yeah, but what is it there inside? <laughs> what are you going to end up with? Uh, what are you consuming, in fact, uh, w- when you are taking that pisang goreng from point oh, of view of nutrition? That's, that's, a, that's a deep question. <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, when, when you fry the banana fritters, right, mm-hmm. or, or pisang goreng in, in, in the native language, um, one, one, the first thing that happens is what happens to the banana, all right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as, as scientists, we all know bananas, uh, we call them healthy food because there's a lot of nutrition in that one banana and it's convenient. You just pluck it off and, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's done, all right? There's a lot of fiber, there's a lot of... Uh, carbohydrates that you need, there's a lot of vitamins that you need and stuff like that. But when you throw it into the hot oil, hot sizzling oil, Mm -hmm. especially if it's palm oil or corn oil, uh, low grade ones, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, The first thing that happens is all the sugar Mm -hmm. will start uh, caramelizing, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right? And from the natural sugars that you find in fruits, which are... uh, easy for the body to digest, okay? Mm-hmm. They, they change, 
Now, what do they change to? Depends. Depends on what else you add with the banana. Uh, but usually when that happens, you no longer are in control of the sugars that you're taking because more sugar comes up, right? Some of the carbohydrates of the banana break down and form more sugar, which makes the banana really sweet, mm -hmm. really tasty. Right. Uh, but at the same time, it's not exactly good for your body because there's more sugar that your body has right. to work with, right. Right. right? On top of that, uh, the fats, then we talk about the fats that change. When you put in uh, the flour and you dip it into the hot oil, all right? the natural fats that are in the banana start changing, mm. okay? And the chemical, the chemical structure the, of it, yeah. Yes, the molecular structure, the chemical structure of it. Uh, the best thing that could happen to you, the lucky thing, if, if you're so lucky, you know, the guy spends high-grade oil and stuff mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. is that uh, the oil just sticks to the flour and hardens the flour. That's, that's, that's what we hope it happens. But the worst thing that can happen is that uh, the oil changes from uh, saturated or unsaturated fat to trans fat. Right. And once it reaches trans fat, yeah, then it is practically impossible to be digested in your body. It's really hard to digest inside your body. And that causes all sorts of cholesterol issues, triglyceride issues, mm -hmm. uh, liver issues, and da da da, -da. Mm -hmm. You You would know better than me what, what right. kind of yeah, problems yeah, those yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So you when you're looking at fried, yeah. Bananas, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So when you look at fried bananas, those are your biggest concern. The last one that you worry about when they are fried that way uh, is, especially with the older oils, especially if the oil has been reused multiple mm -hmm. times, your fibers in the banana start breaking down. Right. Uh, and when that happens, then you completely lost all benefits of eating a banana. True. 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 Yeah. You mentioned. You mentioned paleo diet, but you said that you're not really a, a, a complete follower of the paleo diet, right? But to what extent, yeah. what have you implemented? Which elements of the paleolithic, paleolithic diet uh, have you implemented in your system? Okay. Um, the number one thing I disagree with the paleolithic diet is that uh, they claim, they claim, the paleolithic uh, people claim that Everybody should follow a paleolithic diet. That alone, I disagree. <laughs> All right. Because <laughs> cool. I, 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 I don't I believe. All right. Yeah, because I, I, I don't believe that every, everyone is the same, uh, especially when it's their goals and their target. And I, I don't think that everybody should be the same kind. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Absolutely. It's for the same reason that uh, I fast, but I don't believe that everybody should fast. Right. Right. Absolutely right now, right. Muslims, Absolutely. yeah, like now the Muslims are in a period of fasting, mm -hmm. uh, and I and I join them with fasting, mm -hmm. but I don't tell my friends, hey, you should fast too. No, I don't do that. So that's that's the number one thing I disagree. Okay, so okay, uh, sure. let, let, let's get back to that. You know how it all actually we've been we've been carried away, you know, a, a bit in our conversation. Then yeah, uh, I, I gotta explain <laughs> that there's also uh, there was an interruption in between. Uh, Kenji had to attend to a few things, you know, and uh, we had to disconnect. So we're coming back again and just uh, yeah. take it away from the same point where we stopped the conversation a few days ago. So what I want to know, you know, it yeah. was uh, pretty much uh, of a heavy transition from 117 to 72, and that happened within quite a short duration of time, like three and a half months. So I'm curious. Of, yeah, at the end of the... Yeah, I'm curious of how exactly your body felt and how exactly your body responded to that. Because uh, first of all, it's a huge burden off, you know, it's like 40, 40 over kg, you know, just minus. Yeah, 30, you know, so 38 kg, yeah. 38 yeah. kg. Yeah, so how did you respond to that yeah. physiologically? Did you go through some uh, not so good transition period, you know, when you had to... Uh, sort of have some discomfort, you know, or something like that, or it was just like getting better and better? I think uh, the good thing was I did it when I was young. <laughs> so it didn't have a uh, lasting uh, physiological effect. Mm -hmm. uh, the first few, when, when I officially started, the first weigh-in I had, I was already at 98 kg on the first day. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the end of three months, 
I was already at 78 kg. This is the official record, 98 to 78 kg. Mm -hmm. That's the official record. Uh, and after that, another two weeks passed when I finished uh, my own program where I was 72 kgs. Mm -hmm. So during that process, when I was going down from 115 to 98, that, that part of it before the official weigh-in uh, was about a month. And uh, in those three and a half weeks to a month, I, I actually felt very, very tired. Very, very tired. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I would be sleeping for eight to 12 hours a day mm -hmm. because I was so tired. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, I had a very bad habit of sleeping at six o'clock in the morning. So when I was trying to lose the weight, the first thing that I did was I brought up my sleeping time to 2 or 1.30 in the morning. Did you exercise and, at the time? Uh, when I During that period when you were losing your weight rapidly, did you exercise? When I was 115 kgs, I tried exercising, but it didn't really work. Uh, I got myself injured in my knee and uh, I stopped. I stopped exercising mm -hmm. for three weeks until I was 98 kgs. Mm -hmm. uh, then I was a bit more brave to try badminton again. I was trying to play badminton again. Uh, and the first few weeks of playing badminton, was very bad for my knees, was very bad for my ankle. I had an ankle injury and a knee injury. Uh, so I had to play with a knee guard. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but you never as I lost weight, gym, heavy weight. Oh, no, no, no. So it was I didn't do any gyms. Yeah. Which is badminton. Right? No, just badminton, yeah. Uh, after two weeks and three weeks of badminton, I had a knee injury. Uh, so I added extra strength training for myself. So I did uh, skipping rope. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I did skipping rope, uh, my ankle injury acted up. So it was very difficult to skip, you know, when you're trying to jump rope. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to jump because my ankles and my knees are weak. Uh, but I kept trying. Uh, I didn't know how to skip rope until I was 98 kg. That was the first time I tried skipping rope in my life. Uh, but I continued trying and uh, I, I think I lost a lot of weight due to that uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. after, after I did skipping rope and badminton, uh, I tried to do planking for the rest of my exercise. And that really helped to shape I only did like 15 minutes of skipping rope every day, three minutes of planking every day, and you mean the plank, one right? minute. Yeah, just planking, plank, just yeah. hold the plank, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I love it. It's one of my favorite. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really powerful exercise. Yeah. Uh, and I did badminton once a week, once or twice a week, depending on the week. So that was the only exercises I got until I was 75, until I was 78 kg. Mm -hmm. At 78 kg, my body had become so light. And because of all the plankings that I was doing, my upper body strength was, was very built up. So what happened was I played badminton. I made a smash so hard that my right shoulder dislocated. I smashed too hard, so it popped out. Uh, so I couldn't play badminton for a while. So that, that stopped me from playing badminton right. for almost three months uh, for the recovery period. And I went into hiking uh, and I started jogging. So last year, I did six half marathons. Yeah, yeah I, I can imagine suddenly when you drop off your shoulders, all those kilos, your body feels yeah. so light. You know, you, you feel that you're capable yeah. of doing so many things that uh, you wouldn't even dream yeah. of. Right, and then uh, yeah, you, you, you know, never thought you could exactly, exactly. For me, it was a, a bit different way because I I was a chubby when I was kid, you know. But then I joined gym and I gained more strength and and uh, uh, muscle 
bulk. However, I was always a bit overweight. You know, my BMI was always on a higher side. So I had a lot of subcutaneous fat and visceral fat as well. You know, so, and, uh, you know, as I'm growing bigger, I was sort of like throwing, trying to gain more strength and extra muscles, you know, and stuff like that. So, and I've uh, done different cycles in with the gym, you know, and, and mm -hmm. with uh, some of the performance enhancer, enhance, enhancing uh, medications and stuff like that, you know, but not nothing to the really extreme level, you know, but something just like a beginner you know so in a very mild form you know nowhere close like the semi pros are doing you know just because if mm -hmm. you go to gym you know it's uh, like literally you're gonna stay there for a couple of weeks especially those days in yes. 90s you know early 2000s and then uh within the, like by the second week you you will if, even if you didn't know anything about steroids or any other performance enhancement drugs you know, you you got to know about that ultimately because it's there. Yeah. There, you know, you go to the locker, you know, the changing room, and the guys are talking about that. You know, and then uh, you see yeah. the big fellas who are. And, and I'm telling the stories what was happening in the eastern Ukraine like 20 years, 25 years ago. You know, so the big guys oh, are coming oh. there, blowing out open those uh, uh, bottles and cans. You know, and there's like pills there and supplements and uh, all that nutrition stuff and the protein pills and stuff like that. You know? so, <laughs> Of course, there's gonna be a conversation about uh, some sort of uh, steroids, you know. The what are you taking? Stuff like that. Exactly. You know, so the people are exchanging, and then on top of that, you know, me being a, a doctor, you know, so in 1990s, you know, I went to the medical school, medical university. Also, it's like I'm practicing since 20 years ago, and uh, uh, you know, you you build that your own community. So I have friends who are like uh, much bigger than me, and they were doing much heavier workout and. Uh, being doctors, you know, and we had the doctors community in the martial arts and stuff like that. So being a doctor, it's much mm -hmm. easier for you and, and safer because you, you, you know, what you're going to achieve with that medication. You calculate the dose properly. You look at all the cons, you know, so you, you sort of, you prevent uh, negative side effects happening in your case. Yeah. And you do it in a much safer and more effective way than uh, a right. non-medical profession. More you know, educated way. Exactly. You, you know better what you're doing. That, that's uh, the reason why uh, it, it's great to have uh, a, a coach, a trainer, who is a medical pr practitioner as well, because he can sort of advise you better on, on the safe journey. You know, so yeah. I did try all that stuff. And uh, uh, as, as I said, as I was growing old, I was growing bigger. So there were a couple of moments in phases in my life when my body weight was very low. It's like uh, about 18 to 20 years ago, I was as light as 73 kilogram. And I felt Ooh. extremely great at that time. It's like uh, uh, your hands, literally, you feel that they have the same power as your legs, you know? You literally can yeah, yeah, your yeah. hands. <laughs> and you, you're like an ape, man. Absolutely. And uh, you can jump double the height and stuff. Yes, 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 yes. And it becomes so flexible and all. So over the years, I've lost that. So I sort of, I gained it back for the past four years, you know, because as you grow older, to cut down those, like, I'm minus 27 kilo of fat and I gained about uh, extra 35% of lean muscle mass with the program that I was well, doing. That's great. Myself. Yeah. But then again, it took me quite a bit of time. You know, it's not that how mm -hmm. it would have been uh, easy and faster done if this would have been 10 or 15 years ago. So as you age, it's getting yeah. more and more difficult. And you need to apply that multifocal approach from many, many directions because you can, you might be doing that nutrition right and the exercise part of it. But then there are certain, uh, the foes, you know, the enemies of uh, an active yeah. lifestyle that come along the age, like uh, joint pain, you know, like the, lower lower back pain and the lumbar spondylitis yeah. cervical spondylitis you have this uh, uh the proximal epicondylitis you know the tennis elbow the vibrational yep. disease the the, yep. day, the muscle ache you know and all that kind yep. of stuff you know that you don't have like when you're a teenager when you're in 20s and that hits you you know yep. when, when you cross and you go to the fifth decade of your life you know so it's oh yeah you, you, that's you, where they really come in yeah, but it's very important that you keep on doing that and keep on doing it all. So after you've reached that target three months, uh, three and a half months after you started, how did you maintain yourself after that? Was that easy 
because when I like any cravings going back to the previous nutrition style or it's pretty much like you enjoy it and you just go with the flow and it's free and easy. It's, it's funny how you ask that question, you know. Um, I just went to buy new clothes, like uh, when, when they announced that the MCO was going to conditional MCO and the supermarket were open. Right. I, I went shopping because <laughs> I, I have no pants to wear. Really, I have no pants to wear. All my pants were at okay. size 42, okay. right? They were all 42 inches. And at the end of my uh, weight loss program, I was size 33 inches. I lost uh, nine inches off my waist, mm -hmm. you know? And when, when you look at losing nine inches off your waist, you can't alter your pants. They just don't fit. No way. No <laughs> so, way. Yeah. You, I, I took it to the tailors and they were like, no, I can't do this. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So what happened was uh, uh, right after I lost weight, uh, it was in September when I, when I was at 72 kgs. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, she brought me to Hong Kong uh, and we had a very nice holiday in Hong Kong for a week. And when I came back, uh, I was really light. I was like, I, was, I felt like flying. Uh, and no, and that's that, because you're very and that, probably. Yeah, because I was like a lot thinner. Yeah, in love, in love. Plus the emotional component of it. You know, you go for a <laughs> girlfriend, you know, to Hong Kong, you come back, you're flying. Yeah, that's, that's also the reason, right? So, but immediately after that was Christmas and then it was Chinese New Year, right? And, and everybody, at that time, uh, my business and, and, was and growing. You, you, know, so you were not married yet, right? No, no. So no. you were getting all yeah. that powers. So everyone was trying to, Everyone was trying to ask Kenji out for lunch, ask Kenji out for dinner, want to know how he lost the weight, you know? So everyone would buy me food. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Just yeah, to to correct, correct. That's, that's the Asian style, right? You, you yeah. Yeah, that's the hospitality, you know, and the, the cordial yeah. and the approach, the friend, you know, so what's the best time that we can spend together? You know, just let's go and grab, grab some food, you know? It's like really the food yeah. very nice. The food is so delicious. <laughs> but, uh, and, and you don't think of the repercussions of that, you know? comes along the way exactly years after that yeah so, so uh, um, did, did you have the idea of talking about uh, your program or trying that to uh, to treat or help other people at that time i started at that time when i came back from hong kong mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that i tried to do was to change my business into a weight loss business and uh, it was it was amazing i helped uh, about 20 people lose weight and you were, the 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 right? you, you were running a restaurant, right? You were running a restaurant before that, yeah? So was, was that still cafe, going yeah. on? The cafe was there still yeah. going on? Yeah. Did you try when to I change came back the, the menu from... like, or, or the style, how it is cooked, you know, to make it more healthy or something like that? Or no, you, I mean, that was like a standard. Uh, you know what I did when I came back from Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. I just dropped food out of the menu. Really? There was no more food in my cafe. Yeah. Okay. I only sold coffee okay. and tea mm -hmm. and some form of energy bars, but no, no proper food anymore. No more spaghetti, no more lasagnas, <laughs> no more, none of them. Because well, you, you, when you, I was you, in you Hong Kong. something, at least you could have just open for dining, you know, like come and get some uh, organic, ketogenic dinner early dinner you know something like that salads or some you know meats with yeah i i wanted to but it's so expensive in malaysia to do that oh. uh, it's really not it's not viable for a cafe to uh right. provide healthy food in malaysia it's just so expensive right. if you if you're doing it for yourself for example if if you were to because as a cafe owner the mm -hmm. cost of your food needs to be at about uh, 30% of the price you charge people so that you can afford to you know, waste some food for uh, expiry date, some food will go into, you know, you burn the food or you cook it wrongly or they don't like the taste. So you need to be at 30% of the price you charge people. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're going to tell people that just because this is healthy food, I'm going to have to charge you 36 ringgit, 
right. they, they won't be able to afford right. at that time they won't be able to afford that kind of meals mm -hmm. even though nowadays everybody eats like 20 something 30 something ringgit uh, at kfc and mcdonald's <laughs> but back then uh, it yeah. was ridiculous well, back the then you could get a mcdonald's so for six from, bucks from from the big guns in the food and beverage industry you know you have yeah. this, all the fast foods yeah. and uh, in every village in every compound all over southeast asia there's hardly mm -hmm. any uh, uh place which is inhabited by people which doesn't have kfc i believe right yeah and then 80 percent of the time there would be a mcdonald's you know just opposite that kfc so, yeah exactly <laughs> and you know I, one one of so many years in, in one Malaysia, the, the, the mama shops, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, everywhere, yeah. all over the place. And, and the food is delicious, you know, but of course you don't feel good after that, you know. Uh, you have that yeah, hot burn, you know, and it's floating and stuff yeah. like that, you know, but in the long run, it just ruins your health, your metabolism, just disastrously, you know, completely. Yeah, it's crazy. I, in fact, um, last year, I was very successful. Uh, so, so back to where we were. Mm -hmm. After all the feeding from everyone, uh, everyone was trying to feed me nonstop. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually gained a little bit of weight. I went back up to 80 kg at that time. Uh, I went back up to 80 kgs. And everybody was surprised because it was six months of non-stop eating and eating and eating. And I would eat anything. You give me pizzas, I would eat pizzas. You give me uh, bakute, I would eat bakute. You give me anything. Mm -hmm. ask, you, you can ask Joel. <laughs> I brought him mm -hmm. up for food. And then it was like, there's this place to eat here. There's that place to eat there. And then he was like, you eat a lot. And I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> so I was eating every day, like three to four meals a day. and. That was bad. That was very bad. So I, I put back my weight. My weight went back up to 80 kg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the surprising thing, the surprising thing was my weight went to 80 kgs, but my fat uh, mass stayed the same. Okay. So That's I was building yeah. muscles. Yeah, I was building muscles while I was eating. And that led me to find out, to understand that reducing your calorie count mm -hmm. uh, is a good way to lose weight okay but not a good way to build muscles it's not it's yeah, very bad almost, obviously uh, yeah, right in the long run to build strength all right so so uh in fact last year i did uh i did a program that i, I if you don't mind i'll just talk a little yes. bit about it yes. uh, i did a program where all my students in this program are allowed to eat KFC, mm -hmm. Kentucky Fried Chicken, yeah. okay? every other day, all right, as long as they stick with the exercise regimen and the other supplement regimen that I have, and they will see results in their weight loss. Still a bit harsh here, but poor, poor fellas, you know, like every alternate day. Were there actually people who uh, understand the need of a healthy lifestyle and some improvement or betterment that has to be done with themselves and would go to KFC every alternate day. You know, I, I hope not, you know, you, you, you can't teach like, <laughs> between those tools. You, know? you got to choose what exactly you want. The best part of it, the best part of it was this. I had eight students in that program. Okay. Right. Out of the eight students, six of them told me that ever since the program they have officially stopped eating fast food because they are mm -hmm. so sick and tired of it mm -hmm. even though they even though they lost weight during the six months they had with me they had six months with me uh the highest count was 20 kgs she lost 20 kgs in six months eating kfc every alternate day all right mm -hmm. but but after that she imme she immediately eliminated fast food from her diet because she was so sick and tired of the greasy feeling right, that she gets right, after right, eating the fast food right, right. so i found that i found that it's a it's a good way it's a good way to help people see for themselves why fast food is bad for you because 
when you keep telling them that fast food is bad, fast food is bad, they, they, don't, they don't like it. People don't like being told stuff. But when they feel it by eating it every alternate day, right. Right. oh, they really feel the grease going in their mouth. Yeah. They really feel that like, and sticky then after, feeling you, you in their mouth. You the toast after that, and then two hours, three hours down the road, you're hungry again, and you're in that horrible Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that's why all my eight students, out of all my eight students, six of them have sworn off fast food. Yeah. <laughs> Plus which, all that, which I think all, is a great achievement. Yeah, yeah, all of it, all of it, absolutely. Uh, everything that is frozen and everything that is coming from the, the fast food industry, it, it lacks fiber tremendously. So you end up being constipated, mm -hmm. you end up being bloated, then you develop all the, the inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, you know, all that stuff. And then when yeah. you have a, a contrast, you know, when you have something to compare with, how it is, how the grass is green over the opposite bank of the river, you know, how much better it is to be there. So you sort of like, you don't want to go back to that again. You know, you don't want to suffer yeah. half of the night because you can't sleep and you have a horrible heartburn, you know, and stuff like that, or you bloated tummy. You know, so when, when yeah. you have, when, when you tasted already, how is it to be well, you know, you sort of, you don't want to, to be free. Yeah, to be free. Exactly, exactly. I have yeah. that uh, uh, with uh, sugar. When I, I completely let go of sugar, I, I don't take, you know, because of that, I don't even take juices, you know, it's, I, I cut down the fruits tremendously, you know, so uh, no cakes and stuff like that. So you don't suffer for like a couple of weeks, definitely. You have that horrible craving, mm -hmm. that substance, the sweetness of it. And then uh, from uh, two months, two weeks until two months, you have that a transition, you know, when your metabolism changes to the uh, enabling itself to metabolize the ketone bodies, and also you have that muscle weakness, uh, and especially if you go out and exercise heavily in the gym, you know, so mm -hmm. you just feel that uh, you, you, you can't push it anymore, you know, you, you hit the wall, you know, and, and you're tired and you're constantly hungry. So uh, when you're trying to do that, implement first the intermittent fasting that I've done to myself, you know, you, you have that meal, it's a huge bowl of some salad, you know, it's with eggs and stuff like that, you know, but you're hungry after that immediately. So yep. you have to put a conscious effort to overcome that. Uh, probably the, some other things may help you along the way, you know, like caffeine. And also, it, it's also a very good thing. You know, I don't drink instant coffee anymore, you know, I uh, get that, the grinded coffee, you know. So that helps a lot. And uh, uh, as that sweetness goes and as that ability uh, uh, to the switch of the metabolism, you know, happens, you actually pass that two months period and then you're free. Uh, yep. Yeah, accidentally, somebody gave me like a, a few months ago, you know, like three, four months ago, something like that. Somebody gave me a cup of coffee with a tiny amount of sugar like some half small teaspoon there or something like that and I just tasted it like, oh my god yeah. what's that horrible substance you know you forget about the taste it's like when you're off from the smoking and I, and I, I was a smoker for 23 years you know before I stopped and then I had to go back to that you know and I stopped again you know but something uh, something helped me you know some particular program that exist there so it almost instantly cured me from uh, that nicotine addiction and also and what i know that even if i take a cigarette and i try to smoke after that you know i feel that the horrific taste of it you know that i no, no, i just don't want to go back yeah. to that anymore yeah and, and you feel great case. yeah 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 so you you feel so great when uh you you are off that hook you know, so, and, and yep. you can perform also, you know, and then your voice <coughs> becomes lighter and then you can exercise again with uh, much more effort and energy and all. And then of course, when your brain lights up, you know, when you're on a proper ketogenic diet, you just, you, you think so much faster, you know, and your sleep is better, you know, because you're not loaded with carbohydrates, sugar, a few hours before you go into bed, you know, and then you, you, you don't continue metabolizing that stuff while you sleep. You know, so yeah. so how many times a day are you eating now? Uh, right now I'm in the middle of the Muslim fast, mm -hmm. so I'm only eating twice a day, uh, once in the morning and once at night. That's okay. it. But you still yeah. take uh, liquid, 
right to drink water no 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 oh i don't completely. Drink at all. all right so you you're yeah. fasting throughout the entire ramadan completely yeah but you yeah. do that not not because of the religious purposes you are you're just joined together because of the health and, and your program i'm right? doing it when when i first joined the uh ramadan fasting uh, it was because of peer pressure all my friends were muslim so mm -hmm. they all fast and i was in the military at that time so okay. you know when you're in the military everybody right. fasting and you're the only one in the cafeteria it's like <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> you feel, right. you feel odd you know True. yeah so um when i when i said i wanted to try starting fasting so that was what happened and then when I went into nutrition, uh, that was when I found out uh, through Dr. Osumi's work mm -hmm. uh, what fasting can do for your body. And, and I think that is great. And now, now I'm practicing it. Although uh, it always is the case where your first few days, you feel a little bit uncomfortable because your normal eating habits change mm -hmm. to the Ramadan habits. Uh, but that's to be expected, you know. So it's a few days of your body switching over to the mm -hmm. Uh, timing of food and stuff like that. So other than that, it's great. I'm telling you, it's great. You work mm -hmm. faster, you think faster, you communicate faster. You, you do everything like faster, you know, because your mm -hmm. body is refreshed. Yeah. That's, so why, you, that's why it feels... You, you give a consultancy, sort of you give a guidance to people, to your followers, uh, how to do it. Uh, and you also give public speeches, right? So I'm just trying yeah. to understand how exactly, how people can find you through which channels, which sources, social media. Oh, they can all find me presence. on my Instagram. So just look for Kenji Lee, right? My Instagram is KFC, Kenji Fitness Club. Yeah. All right, Kenji Fitness Club. Because I, KFC. yeah, because right. I, I used to love KFC though. So. <laughs> so um, when people come remember. to you, uh, who, who is the crowd mostly, men, women? What's the age, uh, or you have like a diverse crowd, you know? And what are the specific problems that people come with? Uh, what are the expectations? I mean, do they want to achieve something, or they want to get rid of something? How does it work? Uh, it's quite diverse. Uh, most of the people come in to want to get rid of fat. They they mm -hmm. feel they're too fat. They want to lose it. Uh, men and women both, uh, fifty fifty. Uh, age group, usually it's about the 20s to 40, 20 to 40 region. Like my youngest, uh, my youngest is 22, my oldest is 72. So mm -hmm. it's a mix. Uh, but the younger ones will always want to lose weight and the older ones, it's always about pains. They want to remove pain, they want to relieve pain and all that. Which is why I actually have a question here uh, that I wanted to ask. Dr. Dimitri's uh, opinion, yeah. professional opinion. Uh, what do you think of nutrition for people with medical conditions? Like for example, they are diabetic, uh, mm -hmm. they are, maybe they have uh, cirrhosis, maybe they have uh, liver scarring, maybe they have hepatitis. What do you think of using nutrition as an alternative or as a supplement to their medication that they're taking? What do you think? Well, you see, if you, uh, it, no matter, put it this way, no matter what point of view you're going to look at it, either from the point of view of the conventional medicine or from the point of view of holistic and regenerative or preventive medicine, in both mm -hmm. approaches, there is a very significant uh, attention and sort of role which is uh, dedicated to nutrition. Okay. Uh, people do forget quite often that uh, even though they come and see a medical practitioner in the GP clinic, you know, in a general or a family medicine clinic, you know, and stuff like that, inevitably the doctor would uh, give them a leaflet, you know, or some kind of recommendation, or just say, at least go and read online, you know, so what exactly is recommended for you to take, uh, what sort of nutrition, what sort of oral intake, or what you're not supposed to eat because of your condition. You know, so inevitably it is there. Uh, nobody ever said that uh, conventional medicine does not do that. You know, a thing is that it doesn't do it right. Uh, is one sort of one aspect of it. And a second aspect is that, mm, yeah, just as, as I mentioned before, you know, during the uh, first call, 
is that uh, doctors don't really spend much time on nearly they don't spend any time at all on learning the proper nutrition okay and uh, uh, even uh, specific guidelines to what uh, supposed to be in uh, your food you know when it's coming to uh, vitamins and stuff like that the official guidelines uh, uh, might not be always as accurate as uh, an unofficial recommendations okay because there's so many uh, there's always you know sort of like a, uh, a mainstream approach to that you know what the academicians say what the general recommendations you know from uh, health authorities and all will come up with stuff like that but there will always be like vitamin c is one of the classical examples to that you know that's why in different countries you have a, a different formulation with different amount and uh, people will go and talk about the high dose vitamin c and stuff like that but if you want to read any uh, like a mainstream article or something like that or hear that story from uh, a doctor in in the conventional hospital in many countries you won't be even able to get some specific dose of a vitamin C because they will say it is off the regulations. You know, it's totally uh, off the charts. You know, we've got no rights to give that. You know, so yeah. Well, it, it's definitely uh, well for me, a person who has uh, practiced that and practicing it and will keep on practicing. I understand much in more profound way the necessity of the correct diet it all starts with that you know but i look at it differently i i look at that uh, as the one of the most significant and magnificent biological mechanisms uh, which uh upregulate certain longevity genes and that is lack of nutrients that is that uh, a period of time when your cells and your body is in a starvation, starving mode. Okay, so at least eight, 12 hours or 14 hours. And here it's very important to uh, draw a line between the calorie restriction and the time restricted diet. Because uh, as you have mentioned, for, for you normally to develop and to have that uh, protective role for your muscles, you know, and rebuild your muscles, especially if you're heavy, heavy exercise and stuff like that. Every heavy exercise is associated with the muscle damage, you know, so you gotta do the repair of that damaged muscle, muscle tissue all the time, you know. So you should not be like a calorie restricted, but it should be more a time restricted diet. Yeah, so uh, the studies, if you take the comparison uh, between, uh, uh, say, a, a very long term, what they call that longitudinal studies or something like that, you know, when uh, people have been malnourished or just depleted of uh, certain essential nutrients versus uh, people who have done that intermittent fasting as a uh, specific program you see that overall the health does deteriorate in those people who will just keep themselves on a very prolonged caloric restriction you know with a depleted yeah. certain nutrients it it will have ultimately that will have a very damaging uh, effect on your lifespan and your health and stuff like that when you do this like when you get all the proper nutrients but you just eat within that short duration of time and look at it biologically um, you're not supposed to be fed on demand okay you're supposed to find the food find that nutrition the vitamins and stuff like that it will give you energy rebuild your body and after that you're supposed to be busy doing something else and mostly uh, take care of uh, sharing your genes you know which is called propagation and then just take care of your life and uh, go and search for more food, right? Yeah. Because yeah. It's, uh, it's only for the past few decades, uh, you, you can make a phone call and the food's gonna be delivered straight to your door, door doorway, right? But uh, uh, for the past hundreds of millions of years, you're supposed to go out there into the jungle, into the unknown, and with your teeth and claws you know, and stuff like that, whatever God and nature gave you, <laughs> you, you have to go and, and get that food. And not only for yourself, but also for the family, depending on what is the social construct of uh, that, that particular species is practicing. You know, if, if you're a family or a small group or something like that, animal, you know, so you have to feed your miners. Uh, nowadays, well, you just mix everything in a bottle, you know, give them the formula milk and all, and the job is done. Well, uh, it, it was not working like that throughout hundreds of millions of evolution, you know, and we forget about that, and we pay a huge price for that, which are which is the slow diseases of accumulation, the metabolic syndrome, 
the osteoarthritis, the uh, irritable bug bowel syndrome, and then metabolic yep. syndrome, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, and so on and so on and so on. Yep. Yeah. So all these oxidative diseases start exactly. coming in because of exactly. all the yeah. uh, change in our biological eating time and uh, the so, amount of food so that we eat. I, 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 in that way, you know, in that from that point of view, I always look at uh, fasting as a biological way and very simple and very inexpensive and very efficient way to stimulate your longevity genes. And uh, it causes that tremendous that uh, a shift in epigenetic, you know, and uh, you open up and transcribe all the longevity genes and all, you reduce the level of systemic inflammation. And then it changes your entire metabolism. And also I've experienced that on, uh, many patients you know without uh, fully experiencing that on myself but then years ago when i felt that something has to be done you know and start doing that for myself that was a really big change you know when you really feel the effect when you see the effect when you see it on yourself rather than when mm -hmm. you see it on someone else that gives you an extra courage and also it gives you it enables you with uh, uh, extra uh, power and abilities in, in terms of efficiency of your work because uh, you sort of, uh, you, you know the terrain already, you know, you know where those mm -hmm. small uh, pitfalls, you know, where you can just drop your foot in and twist your ankle. You know what, you know you what I mean? And... Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, you, you know those small nuances, those small details, you, you, and, and then it's so easier then for you to explain to the patient what is it to be expected, you know, what they're going to go through, right? So that, that, that's a totally deep, different thing. That's why I always trust enthusiasts and people who, who really do things for themselves rather than the people who just uh, go and preach about this stuff without. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> they talk uh, a lot of shop and then they them. don't do anything. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, what? Yeah. Yeah, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Just, just a. Uh, just an add-on uh, question to, to, to fasting that since you mentioned about fasting is that a lot of people are telling me, Kenji, I don't want to do fasting. I don't like fasting because I don't eat a lot per meal. So can I get away with eating less per meal and eating more meals? Like maybe I eat six no, meals, but I take no. like 400 calories each. No. Well, unfortunately, no. And that's a thing that um, first of all, you have to understand that you neither you get the, the benefits of fasting because you're simply not fasting. Okay, so as mm. long as there is any sort of nutrient, it, it is uh, sort of inserted in the system. Okay, it, you're not fasting anymore. So uh, from that immediate moment, so the benefits that you're trying to achieve, such as autophagy. Just forget about mm -hmm. it. It's just not possible. It just—it's either happening or it's not happening. Okay. Yeah. So it, 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 you will end up uh, just keeping yourself hungry. You don't get the benefits of the intermittent fasting, but uh, you get all the the cons of uh, non-fasting. You know, so you will gradually, uh, uh, you will stably, you will keep the level of the sugar quite high, you will keep the insulin level unnecessary high, you know, and then uh, you will have all that trigger the entire cascade, you know, with your IGF and with the growth hormone, you know, and everything else, you know, and the, uh, uh, the stress hormones as well. It's just impossible. Now, he, he is, here is a shtick, you know, is that I, I believe that it's, it's like out of 10 essential things, if you will minus one, the rest now I'm not gonna work. Mm. Yeah, it, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty positive, you know. Well, because you see, it's almost 30 years of me trying to uh, transform my body in one way or another, mm -hmm. okay? And I gotta tell you that when I tried, whatever I tried, whatever method I tried, there never been a case that I had no benefits, you know, that what well, it didn't work, you know, it always worked. All systems that I've tried, you know, and I've Dr. tried Dimitri. some. Yes, please. Yeah. Hello. Are you with me? Yes, yes, I'm with you. I'm with you. I can hear you well. Yes, I can hear you well. 
It's just uh, your video is paused a bit. Can you hear me? Uh, and we're back. Are you on mute? I think. All right. Yeah. Small yeah. hiccup. Now we're back, back online and everything as it was before. So yeah, I was saying that it, it most of the time, not most of the time, always it worked. There were benefits every time, no matter what I tried, whether it was um, ice water swimming or hot temperature, the extremely uh, uh, hot saunas, uh, at least 110 degrees Celsius, uh, wow. alternated with uh, uh, ice swimming, you know, cold water, you know, all those uh, freezing uh, uh, indoor, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, spas, you know, or very deep bath, Ooh. you know, with that salt <laughs> you know well i tried all of that and then the various sports programs and athletic programs and various forms of diet you know meditation zen buddhism you know and then following uh, other different, different types of diet whatever it is or medicinal approach or uh, pharmaceutical approach to my health you know everything worked but uh there was always one problem uh the stability of the achieved results okay. mm. yes because you get it you get things fixed you enjoy it and then as you enjoy you you sort of continue going on with your previous lifestyle you've done some change. you get relaxed yeah you, you sort of you get relaxed exactly and then everything comes back and then you try something yeah. again you know so uh, only when i start doing all at once without any mm -hmm. exceptions only then it was working then it really started working and then it, it lasts for years now you know so uh it, it also is so great that uh, when you have achieved that more or less stable effects and you are there say for years you know even say once in a while uh you just cut a slack you know and you give yourself a treat <laughs> and some on a, on a kid's birthday, you know, with cake or, or ice creams, you know, and things like that. Uh, sort of, you know, where to compensate that. Uh, sometimes, if I know there was going to be a birthday party or something like that, you know, just uh, go and wish uh, my mom the kids for the Mother's Day, you know. So I would have like uh, uh, calculate the time when I supposed to eat or when not to eat. You know, I would even skip that my one or one of the two meals in in the day that I would have taken, you know, and just eat that. Because I know, well, anyway, you know, I'm going to mimic diet also pharmaceutically, you know, I mean, pharmacologically, sure. you know, whether metformin, for example, you know, and then I'm going to probably, yeah. depending on the, my oral intake, I will change the dose of metformin as well, you know. So, and, and but you see, this is uh, quite complicated because if, say, uh, you are a medical practitioner that uh, is aware of uh, all the new discoveries about the MPK upregulation, you know, and stuff like that. If you're familiar with the David Sinclair work, you know, and you heard of the metformin and respiratory and stuff like that. And you sort of, you, you take it yourself, uh, 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 sorry, I mean, you, you promote that or you recommend that to patients and you don't take it yourself and do the heavy exercise in the same time so you don't really know how it feels okay so you won't yeah. be able to explain to your patients you know because uh now let me explain because probably uh for most of the people who would hear this they would not understand what i'm talking about you see metformin is a very great medication it keeps your uh, the sensitivity uh, towards the insulin high you know that so-called the insulin uh, uh, resistance it, it inhibits it you know so it normalizes your sugar level it lowers your sugar level it lowers the systemic inflammation but most importantly it upregulates uh, specific genes in every cells in our body that will uh, uh, make our cells live and work as, the, the, as if they're younger okay and mm -hmm. uh, uh, from the uh, biochemical and pharmacological point of view you can say that and some of those drugs are also named as uh, uh, diet or uh, calorie restriction mimicking or diet mimicking 
drugs or dietary making medications because the similar effects that you can achieve with those pharmaceutical agents you are supposed to achieve with uh, uh, fasting okay so it's a fasting mm. mimicking drug sort of in a way uh, yeah so you can trick your biochemistry even when you don't fast completely it is possible However, you will not get that absolutely clear and perfect effect that you get with a biological approach. You know, you will get some cons of it, you know, for and then for instance, when it's coming to metformin, the metformin it inhibits the mitochondria genesis. You know, so the formation of new mitochondria and the proliferation of the mitochondria inside your cell is actually inhibited by metformin. And how long that effect may last we don't really know for sure. So uh, there is an opinion, and some people have been saying that, for example, when I, I know when I exercise on that day, I will not be taking metformin, I'll skip it, and I'll only take it on the days when I take food and I don't exercise. But then again, you don't know to how long that e effect that, that, that will inhibit the production of mitochondria to turn the mitochondrial genesis. You don't know for how long it's gonna, because perhaps it's like up to 36 hours or so, you know, so even if you take metformin at every alternate day, still you will not be able to mitigate those effects completely. Now, why am I talking about yeah. that? It's just simply because when you go to gym and you do a high intensity training or high intensity interval training or any form of uh, so, sort of the anaerobic exercise and all, especially when you do it in the gym with the heavy weights and all, it will become more and more challenging and difficult for you to perform the same exercises. You will just be tired easily. And I've experienced that with myself. And then uh, mm. sort of, but, but then of course you have to put a sort of have that conscious understanding of what is pulling you back, you know? So, you know, all right, that's because uh, probably taking the mat for me. And then uh, it, it's very important that you will uh, program your year uh, to the months or the cycles when you are on specific uh, treatment and then uh, uh, you are off that specific treatment. You probably heard of the hormesis theory and the mitohormesis and all that in simple words that all that doesn't kill me only makes me stronger. So the best effect you ah. get when you sort of, you give some kind of a damage to yourself, to the biological system, to the cells, but it should not be a lethal damage. It has to, it should be uh, the way low, you know, the sublethal damage. And then you give an opportunity and you enhance the recovery from that. Uh, both uh, uh, the animal study and when it happens to humans, you know, to the animal studies, the observational studies of humans, they show that, it, it, it gives the best benefits in terms of the life lifespan and the longevity and all rather than you keep yourself in the perfect laboratory condition all the time with the perfect nutrition and all. Uh, have you heard of Eric Weinstein? Uh, it is it, really is a guy he's, uh, from the portal, you know, one of the intellectual dark, dark, uh, dark web. Uh, so really a person whom I really admire and, and uh, on the Joe Rogan podcast once he was telling a story about his brother about 20 years ago he made this observation that uh, if you uh, you see what actually happened is that most of the animal trial clinical trials and uh, animal studies were done on the animals which were coming from uh, uh, one or two specific laboratories and those were the, not the wild type animals but the lab animals and they were brought up in specific condition they were fed with uh, specific food and things like that so uh, 20 years ago he, he sort of he, he his, his brother his brother he has uh, found out that and he made a conclusion about it and he publicly uh, he started sp talking about it that if you compare the dna even the telomeres of the animals which are coming from the laboratory and the wild type animals at a specific age, those, the telomeres of those animals which are coming from the lab will be longer. The DNA will be more stable. The genome will be more stable to that extent that statistically there's a big difference between the wild type animal and the laboratory animal to that extent that whatever experiment is done on the laboratory animal cannot be extrapolated and used on the wild type animals. You know, whatever from wow. a experiment. Yeah, well, that, that, that's a, 
uh, sort of, it's a big game changer, you know, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. They just throws a wrench in everything. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And it also uh, sort of, it, it works in favor of uh, personalized medicine, you know, plus uh, another thing that I think very important for everyone to understand that uh, when we look at the norm in the blood reading, in the blood investigation, the normal parameter, right, the range, the normal range, uh, we have to understand that it, it's also, it's a bell curve, you know, it's, that's a norm for the 20% of the population, but there are 20 or mm. 10, 10% on the extremes for whom that is not the norm, you know, so that yes. has to be taken into consideration tremendously. And uh, uh, so, yeah, coming back to this thing, so, uh, coming back to metformin, you know, so it, it's very important that uh, you, you understand what's happening with your body dynamically, you know, at that particular period of time, and you have a picture of uh, where you're coming from, the starting point, and where you're going to in terms of your biochemistry, right? And then it's very important that uh, you understand the correlation between different parameters, Okay, because uh, when you have a specific problem, when you're obese, when you're diabetic, with uh, uh, hypercholesterolemia, all the metabolic syndrome, all the chaos going on in your body, and you put yourself on a specific program towards health and wellness and all, it doesn't mean that all things will just gradually drop into the normal range. No, it doesn't happen like that. Some things are fixed initially, you know, but you have to probably sacrifice some other things for the sake of... Uh, uh, something else, you know, and then you have to expect that uh, there can be some uh, drawback, you know, you, they, you have to expect that uh, there can be some adverse reactions, you know, which you will gradually, you will fight against and you will compensate in due time, you know, so, because as I said, when you gain something, and you know that on your own experience, when you gain something rapidly, and uh, you will sort of start sacrificing on small things after that, uh, Ultimately, you know, within a short duration of time, you probably will go back by at least fifty percent, you know, from where you start. That's what happened to you as well, Kenji, isn't it? Yeah, because uh, one of the biggest things I did was after after losing all that weight, I went into Chinese New Year mm -hmm. and ate like a madman. <laughs> uh, it was Chinese people in Malaysia celebrate Chinese New Year for fifteen days. Uh, out of the 15 days, eight days were spent with buffet lunches and buffet right. dinners. So, well, well that's every <laughs> wow. animal group all over the world, you know, when it's coming to the main festival, they probably will spend half of the month, you know, just doing that stuff, you know. So, um, apart yeah. you from you having your followers and people who you coach and, and uh, teach and all, you have also, do you have some public presence, uh, like you give some speeches somewhere, seminars? I mean, I know not now, you know, but uh, maybe you switch to the what? webinar or the online education once everything back to normal and reopens probably what you're going to start doing seminars or some talks or what how was that before and what are you doing now what are you going to do after before this i was giving talks at the rotary club the neo club mm -hmm. I, was, I usually do all these things for free i just do them as a community service uh they 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 pay me uh they they wanted to pay me and then i said uh, it's okay, you just pay me what you think you're comfortable with. Uh, because I, I, I'm giving this information based on what I learned, what I know, and what I've experienced myself. So I, I'm not claiming to be a doctor, or I'm not claiming to be a uh, professor on these kind of things. I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, so I don't do uh, public speeches where people pay to come in and join. But what I do is uh, I get invited by people like, for example, uh, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, uh, Desa Park City. Do you know of Desa Park City? But I, I believe that people who are watching that, they for sure is going to be familiar with this. Uh, Desa Park City is a housing area. It's a, it's a residential area that's uh, got quite a good community. Mm -hmm. uh, what they do is they invite me over every Friday to give a speech on... Uh, nutrition and how to take care of yourself how as you're growing live older. In living in that community about a few thousands uh, but the people that show up is about maybe 10 to 20 people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and every Friday I, I have my own team of uh, Mway distributors so I always share 
uh, whatever I learned, the information that I learned with them every Friday and every Wednesday uh, online. All right. right. So, okay. those, those will, so the those folks who are coming for your there. talks, like those 10 to 20 people, uh, is it like every time new people or it's like mixed, you have the repeated viewers and audience or, or some new people mixed, coming? Yeah. Or it's like, uh, is there like a constant club or something like that? People who have been like with you and sharing and then following you? Like, it's about like 60% on. of the people are fixed. Mm -hmm. So, and the uh, other 40% come and go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to get involved with Decathlon. You know, you guys uh, have Decathlon downstairs, right? All right. No, not really. I don't know. I'm, I'm just a, a guest, you know, in, in the studio, you know, because I'm not really permanent. <laughs> I'm, you know, so I, have to, I work, you know, from different locations also. Yeah, okay, so there is just a, downstairs from the office, there's uh -huh. a decathlon. Uh, okay. I've been trying to talk with their management to see if I can give public talks on health and nutrition there. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's and another I, venue. I think we should join forces, you know, we should do something together. You know, that would be fun, and uh, I think that would be interesting, you know, for many people. And we can just because we can tell story, you know, you, you and I both we can tell, tell the personal story. Uh, yeah, how we have done of our own journey. journey. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that that's the best testimonial, and I believe that's what people want to hear. And that's actually one of the reasons that I'm I'm having these conversations. I'm recording it, you know, and I put it on YouTube channel, you know, just and it's it's absolutely for free because I want people to hear out, okay, what's uh, happening there. I want people to be more aware, and uh, I want uh, to create that sort of like connect between different types of practitioners and enthusiasts on one side and then people who are uh who have problems you know and then problems yeah. to solve and then i believe that we have quite an efficient effective uh, straightforward extremely safe solutions you know biological solutions which are yeah. given to us by nature you know so it's literally it's out there and the data and the knowledge the science is out there so uh yeah we can just uh, bring the the end user, you know, the, the public with this science and practice, you know, so just you, you're in between, you know, how much better can it yeah, be? Man. Yeah, yeah. All right, bro. Sounds, like, right. A, sounds yeah. like a good idea. Yep, yep. So let, let's work on that. Let's figure out something, okay? It was a great pleasure meeting you, okay? So, and I'm looking forward to it. Pleasure's all mine, as, definitely. As soon as the lockdowns are over and the travel lift is. Uh, uh, Travel ban, travel ban is lifted. You know we can meet in in, in person. You know we can make things. Happen yeah, let's out. do the Malaysian thing and get something to eat. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think it's the right time. I think it's the right time for the proper biohacking in Malaysia because you know, other countries in, in the region have been doing that already. Even the Singapore, you mm -hmm. know, but Malaysia been it, it's like it, it's a diamond, you know, in Asia. You know, it really which is surrounded by uh, <laughs> in all other countries it's uh, it, it's a frame you know to this beautiful diamond you know malaysia is a country which i definitely fell in love with you know with all my heart you know so i think it's the right time to do something new bring that new way yeah. to malaysia okay cheers brother give yeah. me five yes peace out my man yep thank you very it's definitely much fun hanging out with you, Dr. absolutely absolutely mr kenji lee Okay, bro, and I'll put uh, there in the description to this video the links from you. So just don't forget to share what exactly you want me to share. Thank you. Right? Okay, bro. Do all send me a copy as well, all right? I will. Okay, share. you take care now. Stay safe, okay? Bye bye.